welcome to the Awakening Podcast. You can find all our episodes on awakeningpodcast.org. We're also on BitChute as Awakening Podcast. I also have the Meditation Podcast, the Learn Polish Podcast, the Speaking Podcast, and the new Crypto Podcast, and all can be found on RoyCollin.com. Today, my guest, please welcome Alan Wind. Thank you so much for having me, Roy. It's an honor to be able to join you. No, delighted to have you. So you might let the listeners know who's Alan and why the the name that you're going to say, the nickname that you've got. Ah, uh, well, um, I was born uh, Alan J. Wind, Alan Joseph Wind, but uh, I spent uh, a large chunk of my career in Latin America. And uh, shortly after arriving uh, in the first country I would serve in, uh, Ecuador, uh, people found they couldn't quite pronounce Alan in Spanish with two L's. It came out as Ayan or something like that. So they kind of rebaptized me with the name of Dr. Alonso since I was working in public health. So what, what exactly were you doing? Because you know you, you worked for the um, ASAD, is it? Is that how you pronounce it, USAID? Uh, USAID. Um, sometimes people call it USAID, but uh, more commonly it's USAID, the US Agency for International Development. Uh, yes, I came to have a career of uh, over 20 years with USAID as a senior foreign service officer, but uh, uh, the book uh, that uh, I brought out recently actually goes into more my early experiences at the start of my career, how I started as a Peace Corps volunteer uh, in Ecuador, uh, initially thinking I was going to serve for two years working in public health and nutrition and then returning to the United States and pursuing a more conventional career. But uh, over the course of my experiences of the two years of service uh, and then subsequent uh, invitations from the Ecuadorians for me to stay on for another few years working with a non-governmental organization, an NGO there, I found that uh, in fact uh, my life plans had changed and I stayed on and ultimately stayed on uh, five years in Ecuador, five years in Bolivia and several years in Peru where um, ultimately I formed a family, met my wife, uh, our daughter was born and it kind of cemented in that uh, direction for my life and career. Excellent, so I mean, you've obviously you know, been around the world, different countries, uh, like uh, Ecuador, what, like, when you arrived there, what, what did you see? What, what, what was the actual purpose of what you had to do there? Well, I think one of the first uh, sites when you arrive in Quito, uh, and this was true of uh, myself as a, as a Peace Corps volunteer trainee, was uh, stepping off the steps of the airplane. They didn't have a uh, sky gate or anything like that at the time in the Quito airport. Uh, you could see the green flanks of this enormous uh, volcano kind of looming over the city, Pichincha. Uh, and you also caught your breath, not only from the, the sight of uh, the green slopes heading on up into the clouds, but also just from the change in altitude. Um, for me, it was the first time that I'd been in a high altitude situation. Quito is up there at about, uh, I guess, uh, 2,000 meters or so, 2,300 meters, not extremely high, but certainly high enough for someone coming from sea level. And, uh, you know, over the course of uh, the next number of years, I would work in a variety of situations from lowland uh, tropical jungles to high altitude Sierra Paramo, you know, the kind of desert between volcano and mountain chains across the Andes. And it really uh, introduced me to the tremendous diversity that existed within those countries that uh, I would come to serve in. And like, because like the carps, uh, you know, for those that don't know, what, what's the, the whole purpose of them? What's, what's the, what are they set out to do? Uh, the Peace Corps? Yeah. Well, the Peace Corps is a program that had been originally conceived of and launched by President Kennedy uh, from the United States. The idea was uh, essentially providing uh, a vehicle for not only young people, but mostly young people, usually right out of college or technical school or the like, 
to go overseas for two years of national service uh, and uh, have an opportunity to uh, uh, be able to serve in some uh, technical uh, volunteer capacity, be it in uh, health or education, agriculture, animal husbandry, uh, or even teaching English as the case uh, might be. Uh, and then to return to the States, having built at the same time greater understanding, having helped uh, the people in different rural and urban communities uh, in the, the third world, what was then called the third world, the uh, underdeveloped uh, countries of Africa, Asia, and uh, uh, Latin America, an understanding of uh, real American life through contact with Americans, but also creating in the uh, volunteers who returned a far greater understanding of what life was like um, overseas. Um, you know, this has been uh, a fairly controversial and notable point of the current pandemic because for the first time in the 60 year history or so of Peace Corps, uh, as a result of the spread of the pandemic last year, all of the some 10,000 Peace Corps volunteers were actually relocated back to the States, evacuated from their countries of service. Um, in practical terms, uh, I mean, it's put obviously a, a bit of a dead stop to the program, but I think it'd be fair to say that the Peace Corps pr provides uh, something of the direct human person to person side of American foreign assistance, humanitarian assistance, uh, building bridges with uh, different cultures uh, around the world. And uh, to have that suddenly uprooted has been extremely disruptive, uh, disruptive for a lot of countries that had come to depend on Peace Corps volunteers for providing teachers and other sorts of uh, uh, technicians to help in different areas. And what about say, the language, but would you have to have say Spanish when you were going to these countries or like how, how was it done or did you kind of just stick to the, your own little group and you know uh, conversed in English? Well, that's a good question. Um, I think it really depended on the, the country where people were going to. I had had the benefit of uh, three years of Spanish in high school, although I, you know, the limitations of high school Spanish in the United States at, at that time uh, were uh, enormous. And so I hardly considered myself to be fluent. But when you join Peace Corps and you're going to certain countries, you receive uh, language training. Uh, immersive language training, in addition to technical training, to make sure that you actually have some useful skills to be able to uh, provide uh, uh, services to the, the often very isolated, marginalized communities where uh, you're serving. When I arrived in Quito, and uh, as part of the training uh, that you uh, receive, uh, Peace Corps actually had a a, a language training center in Quito, the capital, um, I found myself understanding with relative ease within a matter of a number of weeks, the Spanish I was hearing um, in that type of environment. But then I had a very sobering experience uh, within uh, the first uh, month and a half or so when I went down for a practicum to the tropical lowland area of Buena Fe, where my community uh, was located where I would end up serving. And I found myself spending at least the first couple of weeks not understanding a single word people were saying because the Spanish there was pure vowels. There wasn't a consonant to be heard. Uh, there's a, a, a joke in Spanish where you say, uh, uh, en el castellano de la costa comen las heces, uh, which is kind of a play on words to say that they eat shit. Um, as opposed to what the Spanish is intended to mean, which is that you kind of eat up all of the S sounding words. And uh, that's the way it was for me. In fact, uh, with the host family that I was staying with during those first several weeks before I was sworn in as a volunteer and returned to actually live in the community for a couple of years, uh, I, I did completely confuse the names. I, I thought the name of the host father that I was uh, working with on a day-to-day -day basis was Rosario. Uh, 
and I didn't realize that his name was actually Guido. And, and it wasn't until I was questioned by the host mother of the family when she asked me in Spanish, uh, Alonso, do you know what my name is? I mean, I thought I had been very smart and discreet in terms of hiding my lack of confidence in terms of the language and all that, but eventually we managed, managed to clear things up. Um, the ex immersive experience though, obviously of uh, serving elbow to elbow, uh, living like the people that you're trying to help certainly helped improve my language skills and brought me to a level of bilingual fluency very quickly. I, during the five years that I was in Ecuador, I was also exposed to certain indigenous languages like uh, Quechua, which is uh, uh, basically the original language of the, the Incan empire uh, that existed before the Spanish and uh, managed to pick up a bit along the way. Um, in other countries, I've had to pick up other languages. Uh, when I went to serve uh, many years later in Angola, in Africa, I had to pick up uh, Portuguese. Um, and when ultimately in our last country of service uh, as a senior foreign service officer, my family and I were in South Africa. Uh, South Africa is a rather remarkable country where there are actually 12 different official languages, not only English and Afrikaans, which of course are more common for the white population, but uh, there are something like 10 different distinct uh, in, indigenous black tribal languages, uh, which uh, many of which are, are actually spoken across the border into other countries of Southern Africa, not just South Africa. So I've had to, to be flexible in terms of language everywhere we went. And would people, when you go to the different countries, would they always kind of welcome you with open hands or, you know, was there times where people didn't want you there? Well, uh, certainly um, Peace Corps in its philosophy um, was a, a situation where I think uh, they were very keen on making sure that Peace Corps volunteers were, were being sent to uh, with a full, uh, not only uh, approval of, but active uh, engagement and requests really from the host government. And uh, when I was working in different NGOs, I also found uh, a you know, high level of appreciation for the kind of activities that we might be supporting in different aspects of humanitarian assistance or development assistance. Later on, when I joined USAID and as a um, uh, foreign service officer, uh, taking on more of a diplomatic role as well, uh, that was a bit more nuanced. I mean, there were certainly circumstances where in different countries, people would sometimes be, uh, at least people at different social levels, um, or even uh, urban elites would be suspicious of what uh, American foreign assistance uh, really entailed, what it involved, what were the strings attached and the like. And so it required uh, the use of uh, diplomacy and patience and uh, trying to build confidence with people that regardless of whatever sorts of uh, prejudicial biases they may have had, initially about Americans and American assistance that you could build a personal relationship with people. And for the most part, I found myself to be successful in that regard. The one place where I always had a certain amount of misgivings um, about the regard that people had for us and whether or not they wanted us was in Afghanistan. Um, I actually spent a period of time in uh, Kandahar in the southern part of Afghanistan, trying to serve as the senior USAID officer. Uh, and you know, obviously when you're working in a country that is uh, um, under conflict and uh, where there's out and out war, uh, and even worse, where you have the deployment of US soldiers as there, there were at that point, there's a very mixed feeling about the American presence. And though some Afghanis were uh, more than happy to work with us and um, look for ways of uh, uh, building good relationships. There were also some Afghanis that were looking for ways they could manipulate uh, you know, that assistance, uh, look for corrupt opportunities to enrich themselves, or 
there were some Afghanis where you just had a sense of, of dread in the sense that uh, they weren't quite who they were and there was a, an, a hidden agenda. That was actually something that I never felt in, in Iraq or almost never felt in Iraq compared to Afghanistan. You know, Iraq at that time was also a country uh, facing uh, conflict um, and uh, violent extremism as well. But I always felt welcomed and secure in that environment by the Iraqis that I came into contact with. So, um, like we'd say Afghanistan, I mean, with what's gone on recently, I mean, that must have hit home with you because have been spending so much time there. Yeah, no, it was uh, um, a very, very dreadful thing to see the way events played themselves out over the course of the, the last month. Um, I was connected with uh, a number of uh, friends who had worked in Afghanistan in different capacities um, and who had uh, continuing contact with uh, Afghani translators, former Afghani translators or other Afghani contacts. And we were all trying to find ways of connecting people up with the, the different bureaucracy uh, in terms of seeing what would be possible to, to rescue them, to save them from the, the catastrophe that seemed to be about to happen to that country with the, the Taliban. In particular, um, in Kandahar, I was stationed uh, uh, for a period of time at Camp Nathan Smith, uh, which was located within Kandahar city, um, as opposed to uh, the, the huge base at uh, Kandahar Airfield, about 45 minutes out of town. So I was really in the thick of this uh, kind of urban uh, environment, almost an urban warfare environment. The base had been originally staffed by Canadians, and there were still a lot of ties with the Canadians there, despite the, the presence of Americans. It was a base originally um, designed, I think, for 300 Canadian troops. And uh, when I was there, there were about 1,500 American troops and perhaps uh, uh, 50 or 75 uh, hum civilian humanitarian advisors there to try and provide assistance um, in the community. And so we were trying to do what we could, um, you know, in, in the current uh, circumstances to uh, try and support those Afghanis who were using their Canadian contacts to try to, to escape. Luckily, one... Uh, young woman who I had come to know and uh, who I had seen had left um, Afghanistan for Canada uh, some years ago. Um, she was able over the course of the last number of weeks with the help of uh, some extraordinary uh, Canadian veterans in the military as well as the diplomatic service, be able to rescue uh, her family members that were still in, uh, in the country, either in Kandahar or in Kabul. Um, it was uh, a terrible thing to see, uh, very sobering, uh, but I have to say that I kind of uh, buy into the, the argument that really the best time to leave Afghanistan uh, was uh, perhaps 10 years ago um, when after Osama bin Laden had been found um, and dealt with uh, to then begin the, the pullout of American forces at that point and make sure that the Afghani government was in fact prepared um, and uh, that safeguards were in place in terms of the, the corruptive practices that had been so widespread uh, within the country. But then to leave at that point to allow the Afghanis to stand or or fall as circumstances would have it. I think they, there would have been far greater stability at that point. But since that didn't happen, President Obama wasn't allowed to pull out the forces from Afghanistan as he and Vice, Vice President Biden wanted to do at the time. Uh, I think the second best time to remove forces was in fact now, despite the terrible consequences of what we're seeing. I mean, there certainly was no justification for continuing any anything further in terms of uh, any sort of military presence in the country. Uh, like say with uh, Iraq, because I've got a friend in Iraq. I mean, with Saddam, 
I mean, I've heard plenty of people saying that as bad as he was, it's like it was a lot better than the way it's been left. What's your thoughts on that? I think Iraq is a very complex situation. Um, it's been uh, um, evolving and changing even now in, in recent years. I've, I've been in Iraq under different circumstances. I was in Iraq um, some years ago, uh, actually serving on a provincial reconstruction team in the, uh, the Sunni Triangle, uh, the area around Tikrit, actually Saddam's hometown, his home base, Salahadin province, um, which was an area where there was a, a lot of Sunni violent extremism uh, emerging from. And I had a chance to see uh, the, the efforts at that time uh, by the coalition in terms of trying to support the uh, so-called uh, Sunni awakening, um, you know, the, uh, the uh, lifting up and trying to bring into the political process of the Sunni tribes scattered across that portion of the country. Um, admittedly, the, the violence um, and the, the effect of the war um, was uh, to the extreme for, for so many different parties within Iraq. But while uh, you know, some Iraqis would remember with uh, a certain amount of nostalgia the stability of the times, the days of Saddam, that was also a time when uh, you know, there was a, uh, uh, an intense polarization. Uh, in uh, society and, and that where there were uh, restrictions on uh, so many other different aspects of uh, you know the operating of uh, the culture. The uh, uh, Sunnis uh, and the Shia relationship has been one fraught with conflict and division for so many, many years. Um, and the fact that the Shia had been marginalized under Saddam, but then after the invasion were actually um, brought back into the kind of participation that you would expect from the a majority of the population um, is uh, a central reality of that country within the, the Middle East. Uh, many people suspected that, you know, the lifting up of the Shuni would somehow empower Iran in those kind of circumstances. And while it's true, that some of the political figures over the course of the, the occupation and afterwards were tightly connected with Iran, I think circumstances have shown that uh, the Iraqi Sunnis very much have their own mind as well. They're not necessarily committed to following the course of the Iranian uh, Shia clerical leadership. Um, when I went back to Iraq, in um, at the end of 2013 and 2014, I was there under also different circumstances where we were looking at wrapping up the USAID program of assistance that had gone on, you know, something on the order of $8 billion worth over so many years and looking for ways of uh, engaging with the Iraqis to bring that to a conclusion. And I was actually empowered with the, the mission director I was serving then as a deputy mission director to begin negotiating with the Iraqi government in terms of the withdrawal of USAID, anticipating uh, the uh, you know the situation. Of course, U.S. forces at that point have been removed, but we were looking at wrapping up USAID assistance as well in in, in Iraq, and we actually got the prime minister's office and and a number of the ministers of government to agree. To, to value, to look at the range of American assistance and different projects that we were supporting in democracy and governance and civil society and um, building up the, the capacity of the state and to agree to actually fund with their own resources, the foreign assistance program that we had been conducting under the auspices of USAID. We actually got ourselves to the point of the signing of a memorandum of understanding with the Iraqi government, where the Iraqis had chosen certain projects, including a public health project and an education project that they valued 
and they wanted to see continue after USA had left, and they were prepared to put their own uh, resources into it on the order of uh, $50 million a year. But then while I was there, ISIS um, appeared and uh, flowed over from the uh, Syrian border, uh, invading uh, and decimating the, the Northwest and uh, uh, Mosul, Nineveh province and threatening Baghdad. We had a huge uh, evacuation again of uh, Americans who were working within the embassy of uh, uh, assistance and the relationship changed. No longer were we, were we in a situation where we could actually help transfer foreign assistance responsibility to the Iraqi government, but the Iraqis were actually facing a, uh, uh, an extinction event in terms of a, 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 an ISIS takeover, potential ISIS takeover of Baghdad. Um, I ended up being evacuated with a, a group of my colleagues to uh, Germany, uh, to Frankfurt, where the US government had a, a consulate, has a consulate, and we set up on the grounds of the Frankfurt consulate, um, essentially a rump mission. And from there began to run support and coordination with military forces to provide humanitarian assistance, particularly for the Yazidi people uh, in the Northwest section of Iraq that were being threatened with annihilation by ISIS. So all of that is a rather long-winded way of, of sharing with you the fact that, you know, they're very complex social circumstances and uh, difficulties. But I, I personally have little doubt that Iraq and the Iraqis are better off now in 2021 uh, than they were, uh, uh, let's say, 20 years ago. Like, because uh, I've read uh, John Perkins' uh, Confessions of an Economic Hitman, where they're basically the Americans are sending in people to take over, you know, have kind of all these different leaders that kind of throw the country into turmoil. And then the Americans are going in. I mean, like, what's your thoughts on that? I think, you know, there's, there's been a whole range of different stories. Um, and, uh, you know, certainly in the early stages of the invasion and with the creation of the the CPA, the Coalition uh, uh, Protection uh, Authority, uh, prevent, uh, uh, what's the word, the provisional authority. Uh, there were so many mistakes that were being made. Uh, and fundamental to the circumstances was the fact that, uh, you know, under the then uh, uh, the defense secretary, the late Donald Rumsfeld, uh, regardless of what was being uh, lied to to the American public, there simply was no plan for reconstruction. There was no plan for what would happen um, after the invasion, what would happen after the toppling of the government. Uh, that's something that uh, I think is very, very clear, regardless of what was being told to people at the time. And there's been a number of books that have come out that have uh, questioned uh, uh, the motivation of members of the Bush administration, uh, from the president uh, down to the uh, then Vice President Cheney and others in terms of their hopes of being able to raid uh, the resources of the Iraqi state um, on different levels. And while there is some truth uh, to that level of uh, complicity and malfeasance and corruption on some level. Uh, the way things have played out, I think, uh, uh, over time have proved to, to be different. Uh, certainly, I think uh, uh, the Americans have uh, gotten their uh, humbling in terms of uh, the whole issue of nation state building. Uh, but also, I think, and I know your podcast looks at issues of corruption in different environments uh, quite a bit at times. Um, I think that, uh, you know, this has been one in which we've been forced to confront uh, politically and socially the, the drivers uh, that exist between uh, um, uh, actions that we're taking in terms of foreign assistance, humanitarian assistance, and, and other issues. 
working in the field of development and foreign assistance, we often talk about the drivers of stability and the drivers of instability within the different countries that we're working in. And we, in theory, are working to undermine the latter while building up the former. But, uh, you know, I think that uh, we have to look at what are also some of the drivers of stability and particularly the drivers of instability guiding the creation of policy, you know, at the higher level back in, in the United States. Um, nevertheless, um, I'm proud of what uh, um, a number of us were able to achieve under those circumstances. And I think uh, US government assistance, um, even within the, the anarchy and chaos of the previous administration, ended up coming up with some important uh, concepts in foreign assistance that I, I think will prove to be enduring, um, you know, in terms of our relationships with different countries. Uh, one of the former, the, the former administrators of USAID, Mark Green, Ambassador Mark Green, who was uh, one of the people credited with um, founding the Millennium Challenge Corporation and uh, the Development Finance Corporation and some other institutions, relatively new institutions within US government foreign assistance, uh, came up with a slogan on one level intended to kind of keep the Trump administration in the White House at arm's length, but at the other hand, speak to a truth in terms of what we're trying to accomplish in foreign assistance, where he talked about the purpose of foreign assistance is to end the need for it. Um, on a superficial level, you know, some people, uh, perhaps uh, on the left side of the spectrum, reacted a little bit uh, uh, negatively to that, at least at first. But when you think about it, um, I mean, there's, there's actually a truth there. I mean, we don't want to see, uh, you know, this permanent, uh, enduring bureaucracy and presence of the so-called development industry across so many of the countries of the world lasting for decades and decades and decades while the work of development is a long-term project uh, and uh, the requirements to build up the capacity of countries can take a generation or more. Uh, ultimately, I mean, we should be looking at how we can actually end the need for foreign assistance by building up capacity, by building up uh, uh, the uh, anti-corruption mechanisms to ensure that different countries actually invest their own resources fairly and freely into uh, their own uh, uh, empowerment. Because like I've read a few books on, uh, you know, in Iraq and one of them was from, I think from Basha to Baghdad, uh, it was a territorial, army guy that was basically doing the accounts and everything and they were working uh, for the UK and I, they were even clashing with the Americans but like all of these kind of restructuring it's all American companies coming in and basically the country with their oil assets and everything are personally liable you know like if I look at it from a, 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 an innocent bystander's point of view I look at America is just constantly in war and you know, in the name of so-called democracy, but like there's how many millions of innocent people are kind of, you know, die during this. And, you know, there's two kind of questions there really, you know, with the infrastructure, with their own, you know, their, you know, their own companies coming in. So it's not a competitive tender. I mean, obviously if you've got a Chinese company or Turkish company, it'd be probably quarter the price. So, you know, they come in and say price is X. Am I incorrect with that or is that accurate? I think that, uh, you know, in, in all of uh, the, those uh, situations, there is always a certain grain of truth to that. Um, certainly the whole issue of, of tied aid and the uh, continuing, um, you know, kind of connections between uh, corporations, multinational corporations looking for uh, investment opportunities in different countries around the world and tying that to um, interventionist adventures. Uh, there have been certainly plenty of examples like that, not only within um, 
uh, you know, the, the Middle East or Western Asia, like uh, Afghanistan and, and uh, Iraq, but really across the world in Africa and in Latin America. Um, I think that there has been a developing, uh, though, uh, sophistication, an outcry from civil society uh, that has helped to shine a light on uh, you know, where we are going into different circumstances and where we end up repeating the same mistakes over and over again. You know, there's certainly a school of thought that looks at the, you know, the great power competition uh, between the United States and the Soviet Union in the 1950s and 60s and 70s and 80s. And, you know, uh, lots of uh, people were comparing that to the rivalry between Athens and Sparta 2,500 years ago, uh, you know, trying to cast it uh, in that light. Um, and, you know, the kind of endless wars uh, supposedly uh, to promote uh, Athenian democracy, uh, which were in fact uh, for other purposes in terms of empire building. Uh, there's no doubt that there's been a certain a reality over the course of the 20th century of this kind of empire building and center for, for many countries uh, that, uh, you know, basically helped to define at least the initial part of, uh, you know, efforts to try to uh, uh, decolonialize the world, you know, from the late 1950s on. Um, but uh, it's been um, a, uh, an up and down process with the entrance of, of new players as well, who supposedly weren't part of that Western empire building uh, um, ethos. Uh, you know, I think you mentioned uh, quickly China. I mean, I saw uh, personally from my own experiences in Africa, uh, I, I lived and served in uh, uh, Angola and Nigeria and South Africa, but worked in and traveled to many other countries across Africa, uh, the positives and the significant negatives of uh, Chinese engagement um, with uh, their own tied assistance, uh, where they would go into different countries in Africa and uh, offer to build uh, palaces or um, other large uh, buildings or roads and whatnot. And uh, then the uh, tremendous uh, uh, debt that would ensue uh, often to uh, many of those African regimes or the building of infrastructure that would end up being useless within a, a few years because the, either the road would be breaking apart or the building would be collapsing. I mean, we saw this uh, countless times uh, across a number of countries um, that uh, we were serving in. And now with the current uh, Belt and Road Initiative from China, uh, while uh, there may be a greater sophistication on some level to what China has been doing, uh, there's no doubt that, uh, you know, China is trying to supplant the presence of, uh, you know, the Western powers uh, and uh, certainly elbow their way out to much greater influence across the world. Um, all of those things, uh, you know, certainly are drivers in terms of the relationships between the uh, more economically privileged countries and uh, the countries that have been facing the legacy of decolonialism and, uh, you know, the effects of, of the prior empire building of the, of the 20th century, of the 19th and 20th century. But I think on balance, despite all of those negative forces, we actually stagger forward. I mean, when you look objectively at uh, the achievements uh, in terms of development assistance and foreign assistance in, in many countries around the world, there's no doubt that uh, uh, while there has been some stagnation over the last uh, uh, four or five years, particularly coinciding with the prior administration in the United States, uh, looking over the course of the last 40 or 50 years, there's been enormous improvement in the well-being and in the opportunities of uh, uh, you know, hundreds of millions of people um, around the world. Um, the levels of literacy, the levels of female education and empowerment, 
uh, the protection of, of civil rights. Um, I, I definitely am a guy who kind of looks at things a glass half full as opposed to a glass half, half empty, while recognizing the fact there's so much more that we need to do to improve things. Not as uh, we say, Africa and China. I know that a lot of the things were the ports, and I had heard that they, that's what they did. They built the ports, and then said, "Oh, you can't pay." But it's, apparently, they own not just in Africa, a load of Europe as well. They own a load of ports, and that's kind of frightening, you know, to see that they've got such control over that. And these two will change. I mean, certainly, as more transparency is is assigned to what has been what have been the deals cooked up in Europe in Africa, in South Asia, uh, in different countries, I think that new relationships will be renegotiated and, uh, and altered over time as we try to look at you know, how we can uh, pull uh, something more lasting and enduring out of that. Um, I've been uh, following uh, a bit uh, the writings of David French um, uh, I think he's a former New York Times journalist. He's written quite a bit about the, the investments of China in Africa. He's published a number of books about it. Um, and I think he's had a, a, a more holistic understanding of what that represents from his own background, both in Africa as a reporter, as well as time that he spent in China itself. I think he's actually fluent in, in uh, Mandarin and so has been able to look at and engage in different primary source uh, kind of documents in terms of uh, what has been developing. Um, another one, I'd, I'd like to know your thoughts on this. And I'm not just saying America doing this, but I know they do it big time because both Russia, the selling of armaments around the world, because basically that's why we've got a load of the troubles because they've got the arm. I know the Russians are doing it as well and the English have been doing it. And, you know, the French before, they, they all have... You know, but basically, you know, you're arming the terrorists. Uh, that is certainly true. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm one of the reasons why I chose to pursue a career um, within the, uh, the U.S. Agency for International Development rather than the U.S. State Department is because I didn't want to be directly uh, uh, having to justify and support and engage in that kind of political military deal making which has been at the heart of uh, much of you know what you have referred to there's no doubt that uh, you know the uh, the the fueling of uh, so much uh, uh, violent extremism and access to to weaponry uh, for uh, terrible bloody civil wars uh, across uh, much of uh, the developing world has been a result of the very free and easy uh, export uh, of arms and, and uh, making arms uh, so widely available around the world. Um, I have chosen to engage more in uh, circumstances of peace building and conflict resolution and looking to try to build up more of those drivers of stability that I was referring to earlier rather than exacerbating them. And I think, you know, we're, I, we have evolved, I think, as a international kind of consensus, we're in a better place now than we were um, uh, 15, 20 years ago. I think arms sales are not quite what they were 15 or 20 years ago. I think there's a a growing recognition uh, of the need to uh, to uh, uh, you know really stop uh, the corruptive influence of the um, arms industry in terms of what it means not only with the export of arms around the world but also what it has meant within the political process uh, certainly of the United States as well as uh, uh, you know some of the other uh, uh, Western powers. And so tell me a bit more about your book. Well, my book is uh, an adventure that has uh, gone back a, a, a couple of decades, you could say. Um, I had been meaning to write something uh, years ago, and I kind of procrastinated and uh, took down some notes and uh, 
uh, back uh, in the time of uh, the uh, when I was serving in Iraq the first time, I actually began to uh, uh, set up an account with Amazon with what was called, I think, uh, Create Space on Amazon to try to start pulling together some sort of a memoir material, but I just couldn't get my act together. Um, and then uh, uh, in part as a result of the lockdown with the, the pandemic, um, I uh, ended up looking into some things online that I saw in social media, I think either Instagram or Facebook, um, these advertisements I saw of uh, uh, 30 days to publishing your best-selling book, uh, you know, guaranteed process and all of that. And, you know, there, there's a host of these things uh, that are out there, but I, I found one that actually was a very sensible kind of online process, which helped me develop the discipline to actually sit down on a daily basis and follow these exercises that were sent by email every day over the course of the 30 days in terms of what to start with and what to proceed with and how to slowly build things together. Uh, and it was directed to uh, both people who were writing fiction as well as nonfiction, but I think primarily nonfiction. And I found it to be very helpful. And so on over the course of basically two months last year, um, I was able to finally bring together this story, which uh, I uh, wanted to be able to offer to people uh, on different levels. On the one hand, I wanted to be able to share insights of my uh, initial kind of life determining experiences in the countries of in Ecuador, um, Bolivia and Peru, um, and how I then developed a career uh, in humanitarian assistance and foreign assistance, an area that I think is still certainly not well understood by the American public. But I also wanted to be able to talk a bit about the concept of service. Um, this had been talked about uh, a bit uh, in the initial political campaign uh, in the United States in the primaries. I think Pete Buttigieg, when he was running for president, uh, took this up as a theme. I think Bernie Sanders also took it up as a theme briefly. Um, it didn't quite make it into the Democratic Party platform, but I think it's still a, a valid idea. The, the concept of, you know, we don't have a, a draft, a military draft in the United States, and we haven't since the end of the Vietnam War. And I think uh, we are, while there are certainly many positive aspects to that, I think that nevertheless, as a society, we lose something where we don't have an opportunity for young people as they you know, begin their, uh, to go beyond their high school education, their college education, to really be exposed to things outside of their area of comfort and where they're forced to provide some sort of period of committed voluntary service, be it six months, 12 months, or 24 months in different areas, either on a domestic level or on an international level. And uh, for me, uh, certainly uh, this was uh, you know, further reinforced as I watched the effects of the evacuation of the Peace Corps around the world. For me, the experience of a, as serving as a Peace Corps volunteer was uh, really a life affirming choice and a life defining uh, experience. And one that I, you know, I share with some 150 or 200,000 people, I think, who are returned Peace Corps volunteers in the States, people who, you know, served their, their two years and then went on to, to build a life and career, you know, with that kind of widened understanding and perspective that, that can only come from being put into circumstances that are not necessarily that comfortable, circumstances that are not designed to help you necessarily you know, get the next buck or anything, but where you actually have to look at people who are uh, less fortunate than you, who are uh, less affluent than you, who have needs that are not being addressed and find ways of being able to work with them and help uh, uh, support uh, education and health and, and uh, other ways to improve their human condition. 
Uh, so Andean Adventures, uh, I've aspired is, is all of that. It's the first part of what I hope will be um, a larger story. I've been uh, trying to also work on some subsequent books uh, that uh, will talk about my experiences in Africa. Uh, I think uh, uh, Africa and different African countries remain uh, really an unknown for so much of the American public. So anything we can do to kind of boost people's understanding of the complexity and all of the nuances of the, of the uh, so many different countries and cultures within Africa is, is helpful, as well as uh, talk about my, my adventures and my experiences in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, Andean Adventures is a first uh, step towards that. I was able to uh, bring the book to publication uh, uh, on Amazon uh, in uh, basically late August, September of last year. And then uh, as a result of some guidance from uh, some mentors of mine, I chose to uh, uh, develop uh, the audio version of it. Uh, and uh, that was quite an adventure as well. I learned a lot of lessons. Uh, I'm sure some of these are lessons you yourself learned early on in terms did of- you do the, Did you do the audio yourself? I did. I mean, Brilliant. I, no, I, I, they, anyone I've heard, they said it has to be from the author because, you know, you feel the passion and the, the energy comes from you. you know? That's what people often told me, and I, and I tried to keep that. But at the same time, I, I acquired some equipment to, to try to do the audio editing over time. And um, I learned that for every hour of audio recording, I probably had to do about nine or 10 hours of, of editing in terms of bringing it to uh, you know, a, a reasonable state. But then up, eventually it was uh, up, approved by uh, ACX and Audible in April of uh, this year. And uh, there's been a good uh, response, I think, to the audio version of the, of the book as well. Um, it's been quite uh, an adventure. As a sideline, I've been kind of talking with uh, other friends, uh, sharing with them my experiences. And uh, it's been nice to see that a number of them have gotten uh, inspired to be able to go forward and develop their own memoirs, their own stories of, of their experiences, I think, to, to kind of get word out there of the types of uh, international experiences that they've had in different countries. Yeah. Excellent. Listen, Alan, I thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. So how can people get in contact with you? Um, I have a, a newsletter uh, that I uh, try and put out on a semi-regular basis. It's been going out basically every four to six weeks at this point with a hiatus over this summer because of our travel um, and uh, a website. Uh, the website is uh, at enable ennoble. Dot net. That's E N A B L E, E N N O B L E, dot net. Um, and there are also links there in terms of being able to uh, purchase uh, Andean Adventures as well as uh, some other books uh, uh, and stories that are up there. Um, and uh, the book uh, can be found on Amazon uh, as well as uh, uh, in its different versions through. Uh, uh, other other media, but uh, primarily it's being sold uh, on Amazon at this point. Okay, excellent. Yeah, and I'll make sure that uh, I'll put all the links on the podcast description, both on the audio and the video. So listen, thank you very much, Alan. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to be able to share the story here. And certainly I'm, I'm always interested in terms of hearing from, from readers and, and seeing their comments has been uh, some good responses I've gotten back uh, to my email address. People who who go into the audio book, I mean, I'm sorry, the ebook version can also click on it on the links and uh, reach me by by email fairly easily. And it's been able to have a bit of a continuing dialogue with people in terms of of uh, you know our presence in the world and and uh, these issues that I try to tackle in Andean adventures. So thank you very much, uh, Roy, for being able to share a bit of the story on your podcast today. No problem, no problem. So that's all for the Awakening Podcast. You can find all our episodes on awakeningpodcast.org. We're also on BitChute as Awakening Podcast. Be sure to give us a thumbs up, five-star rating, as it all helps. 
until next week, take care.